Welcome to Making Leaders, a series of conversations with people who are leaders of this fast changing industry, as well as those likely to step into leadership in the future. My name is Robert Bell, Executive Director of SSBI. The goal of our Making Leaders campaign is to help space and satellite companies realize their potential for attracting and recruiting talented people and doing it in a time when access to talent is just as big, if not a bigger challenge than access to investment. Making Leaders is made possible this year by the support of SSPI's corporate members and content sponsors, including Access Intelligence, Airbus OneWeb Satellites, EchoStar, Hughes Network Systems, k l Gates, Mansat, Network Innovations Group, Northrop Grumman, SES Global, and ST Engineering iDirect. My guest is David Kagan, CEO of GlobalStar, a company whose roots go back to the first big investment boom in LEO satellites. But years before he got that job, he worked in finance and operations for Nor Norwegian Cruise Lines, which frankly sounds like a lot of fun. And then he took an unexpected turn to lead Maritime Telecommunications Network, or MTN. Now, at that company, he did the things that a good leader is supposed to do, growing revenues, expanding its customer base, which ultimately came to include cruise lines and luxury yachts, um, oil rigs and government vessels. But he also forged a partnership with AT&T to enable mobile phone usage on cruise ships, and that turned out to be something of a deal. Now, when the World Trade Center was attacked, the company was in a position to offer free phone and internet service aboard dozens of ships so their passengers could check in on their loved ones and make sure they were all right. And from there, he moved to Globe Wireless, where he again did what a good CEO should. By the time uh, he sold the company to Inmarsat in 2013, it had grown to support some 6,000 ships worldwide during a revolutionary expansion of satellite communications in that industry. But Global Star has been his biggest act of company reinvention. Working with Chairman Jay Monroe, he led expansion of its services beyond the legacy, and again, a long and proud legacy of one-way messaging and GPS to focus on satellite IoT. And this was followed by a deal that kicked off today's wave of excitement and investment about direct to satellite mobile services by enabling direct to satellite SOS messaging on the iPhone 14. And for these achievements, which had an impact far beyond the companies that he led, SSPI inducted Dave into the Space and Satellite Hall of Fame at a ceremony this past March in Washington. And it's worth noting that this prestigious group he joined, well, it includes Jay Monroe, and the founder of Maritime Telecommunications, Richard Hadsel. Dave, welcome to the program. Thank you, Robert. It's great to be here. And thank you very much for that very nice introduction. Well, you're welcome. I told nothing but the truth so far as I know it. Um, now, you did, as I said, you started out in finance and operations for a European cruise line, and then one day woke up and you were in the satellite business. How did that happen? Well, that's a very interesting story. Um, I was at Norwegian Cruise Line uh, for 10 years. It, it is certainly a Norwegian, with a Norwegian name, a European cruise line, but it's headquartered, it was headquartered in the United States, of course, in, in Miami, where all the major cruise lines are headquartered. Um, I was working in Miami uh, with this fine gentleman, uh, an ex-radio officer uh, who ran the telecommunications department at Norwegian Cruise Line. And this gentleman said to me, Dave, the future is in communications. It's absolutely the future of the company. Uh, it's the future of the world. And this is prior to iPhone or any of these smartphone developments. He said, we are going to change what has been historically a major cost center to the cruise line into a profit center by enabling phone usage for the passengers and crew members on board the ships. And at that point, uh, we had three brands. We had Norwegian Cruise Line, Royal Viking Line, and Royal Cruise Line. Um, and I said, no, that's not going to happen, Johannes. We're going we're gonna to budget what we normally budget. Uh, lo and behold, he was right. And when I started seeing that, ch that change, the turn from a cost center to a significant profit center for the cruise line, it was led by Richard Hatzel and a company called MTN. Um, long story short, I was recruited to MTN to be the CFO. Uh, very quickly after uh, I left Norwegian, Within the first six months, um, I took on the role of CEO of MTN and ran that company for 12 years. And like you said, developed all kinds of value enhanced services for the crew members on board all, all these vessels, for um, the passengers as well, whether it was uh, wired internet cafes, eventually to Wi-Fi internet cafes. But um, one of the big 
contributions we made to the industry and some passengers like it and some passengers don't like it as the story goes. Uh, having your cell phone on on a cruise ship when it was supposed to be a place where you got away. Um, I, my, my answer to that is there is a power button on every smartphone or every phone that you have, you can always use it. Um, but clearly that business, that partnership that you mentioned with AT&T, and by the way, it was not only for AT&T subscribers, but it was for all GSM and um, GSM and CDMA uh, systems. So the, uh, the, the service was global for all carriers all over the world on board the cruise ships. Uh, that was a very difficult negotiation with the various cruise lines and of course with AT&T, but proved to be an incredible business. It went from zero to $200 million of revenue in the first year. Was this a crazy idea? Was, it, was the reaction of AT&T when you came to them or right. did they so, come to you? How did that evolve? Great question. So AT&T came to the cruise lines and said, look, we're, we're seeing your customers roaming into our networks um, in the Caribbean, uh, basically the Bahamas and, and the Caribbean island nations. Uh, and they wanted to capture that revenue while they were on board the vessel through, a, through enabling Wi-Fi services on board the cruise ships. And I remember my business development guy said, we don't need you to extend Wi-Fi networks. We can buy that technology off the shelf. We need, we need you to ex extend your cellular network, which is a whole different kettle of fish. I mean, you, we, we had to put on significant assets on board every vessel and wire it for, with the access points to enable coverage all over the vessel. And so I think of that um, development as the beginnings of the convergence of the satellite and cellular market, um, you know, which is a totally different way to look at it, but it clearly was the beginnings of that convergence. Right, and then one of the tricks about wiring it, but putting cellular service on a ship is that the whole thing's made out of metal. <laughs> right. Oh yeah, we had to be supervised. We had to use their contractors to make penetrations um, in, the, in the stairwells or in the ele elevator shafts. Um, and yeah, that was a major undertaking for sure on board a few hundred major cruise vessels. Now, um, historically, the non-cruise part of this maritime business has been, well, I guess it would be polite to say, reluctant to spend money on satellite connectivity. Um, and yet we know, because it's been shown over and over again, that communications and IT can lead to massive increases in productivity. So I guess this is my question. This question relates to Globe Wireless, right? You build a lot of business there. Had that message gotten through to ship owners by the time that you were sold the, the company to Inmarsat? I think, I think it did, yes. I mean, they recognized that they were now able to utilize email systems. I mean, we think of it, you know, now, nowadays, it's everybody has your email always connected and you're always getting emails and responding. I mean, this was the beginning days of shipping, utilizing email systems while they're at sea in the middle of the ocean. Um, and so very much a change, a dramatic change in their efficiencies uh, on board the vessel. Now, Think about this, they're getting into the next port, they need a certain part. Um, they, of course, email the headquarters, email the home office, email the agent at the next port and arrange for that part to be delivered to the dock so they can then do the repair while the ship is in port. Um, to, uh, you know, all types of activities now was, thought was beginning to take place as far as generating efficiencies for the ship operators, um, whether it's crewing issues, whether it's clearing customs and immigration uh, digitally. You know, that was the next advent of what they were utilizing the system for. Um, and, and as you know, you go on and on, and all of a sudden, what used to be a, an, an Inmarsat only dial-up uh, system on board these vessels, and the vessels typically had 20 to 30 people on board, all of a sudden became a broadband hotspot because the crew members' um, happiness while on board the vessel and the willingness to stay on for longer terms was really directly related to the ability for them to get on the internet and you know that's just the, that's just the way it was and, and the way of course it is today i mean it's it's table stakes really to to be able to recruit uh great uh shoremen and, and people on board you know these vessels yeah one of the things that the most of us don't know or recognize is that when that ship hits the dock is or hopefully doesn't hit it but when it gets into the dock and it's moored in place a clock starts running because every hour is sitting there being idle 
is wasted money wasted i mean it, it's they want to get in and out as fast as possible so the ability to get it all all the communication taken care of ahead of time the customs clearances uh is actually a massive factor in, in productivity right absolutely yeah and with, with the uh with the advent of the broadband capabilities it really beginning it began to enable them to be able to be much more efficient yeah absolutely yeah. Yeah. Okay, so you're now a Global Star, um, which serves a very wide variety of vertical markets, uh, with a notable exception, by the way, if I'm, my research is right, of anything that floats in the water. But you can correct me if I'm wrong. So what was the business like when you joined it? And what were the principal markets that it served? Right, so when I joined, um, the biggest element, and still an important uh, element of our revenue to, to today, was the sat phone business. And that was mostly uh, a B2B type of business. There was a significant consumer part of it as well, obviously less and less given you know, the ubiquitous nature of cell phones and the need to, for a, a, a traveling business person to have the need for a sat phone. Um, it's mostly used today you know, by governments and militaries and, and businesses in remote areas uh, of the world. And so th that was the core business though, was selling sat phones. Um, when uh, when I came into the company and I was told that, you know, basically this, the, the sat phones we have, um, are, the, the inventory is, is, is running somewhat low. We have a choice to make. We have to develop a new sat phone, something like 30 to $40 million investment um, between the chipset and the phone itself. And the phones that we had were phenomenal. They were made by Qualcomm, just fantastic phones. They're still in use today, some 20 years later. Um, and they're providing great service. And so we made the decision that, you know, voice doesn't make much sense going forward. And it's really all about data. Look how, you know, the young generations communicate. They rarely use voice on land, you know, let alone, you know, in a satellite, you know, desired location. Uh, and so we made the decision that we were not gonna make that investment. Um, we were gonna, of course, look to the future. And we started to see it used to be called machine to machine. Now it's called Internet of Things. Everything is on the internet. I mean, I, I don't know about you, but I checked the other day, I had a report from my router and it, it had 14 devices on the on the on my home network. I'm like 14 devices, I, you know, when you count it all up, the TVs and then the laundry and the thermostat and the refrigerator and your different, like your laptop and your home laptop. I mean, it's just amazing when you when you add it all up, how connected we all, we all are today. And so, the, the IoT world, the number of devices, assets, people, you know, is a multiplicate, no, excuse me, multiplying what the number of people is a, it's absolutely a massive uh, number when you think about how, how many people use how many different types of devices, be it at home, be it, be it at work. Um, then of course, all the assets that there are in the world. And again, back to the efficiency story. I mean, it is incredibly important for, all these businesses to know where their assets are, especially when you're talking about oil and gas, agriculture, uh, construction, transportation, you know, those key verticals for us. Um, it's incredible, incredibly important to know that these assets are being used or are they in, are they in maintenance? You know, where are the assets? And you have a dashboard, our customers have a dashboard of where all their assets are and are they being utilized, let alone all the sensor reporting about that asset, engine runtime, um, the, is a door open or shut? The temperature inside the vehicle, the temperature inside the, the cab, the temperature in, inside the trailer, et cetera, et cetera. There's so much data that can be collected um, and transmitted, even in a low bit data rate types of scenario like Global Star has. We cannot do broadband services on our satellite network. And so we had to rely on very efficient, very low cost terminals with a reasonably priced service to really drive that commercial IoT business to where it is and beyond where we're going today. I mean, it is just the, the demand for the services and this data that I talked about is incredibly, it's, it's, it's unbelievable what, what we're seeing. Well, okay, so you had, you, this is a pretty big pivot from a smartphone company to an IoT company. What are some of the things that you can tell us about that you know, you've had, to, you and your team have had to change within the company to make this possible? Well, it's, it's interesting because, you know, a, a, another line of business that was in, 
it's going very well when I, when I got here, and I'd like to think it improved dramatically as well, uh, is our spot business. So this is essentially you know, an, an a, a emergency handheld device that works globally, except for on the poles. Um, and it, it kind of, I don't know if you can see it here. Let me see if I, I risk holding it up, but this is our, one of our core products. And this is, the, this is the real workhorse as well. And these are emergency devices that have uh, tracking and SOS capabilities. And so we've saved close to 10,000 lives since these products were launched 15 years ago. So it's, it's, it's over 1.6 lives per day are saved by, by our spot uh, retail uh, business that we have. There's also some B2B uh, opportunities as well. But Spot was effectively an IoT business and still is to this day. And so the culture, um, as the as the company mig started migrating away from the sat phone focused business, Spot was the next line of business that the company really focused on and has done a great job, um, even before my time, of, of just generating incredible revenue and interest and was the industry leader. Of course, Garmin is now in it and is, is a key competitor. Um, and a few other new entrants as well. Uh, so we're seeing a lot of competition there now. Um, and uh, anyway, so, but the, as far as uh, the culture, the culture is there because this is essentially the same type of data network um, that really is, is honed for low bit data rate type of solutions. And so we just said, you know what, let's create these other devices. And there was other, there was already uh, the beginnings of other commercial devices but let's take it to the next level. And we introduced a product uh, that is uh, zone zero ATEX certified. So it can operate in a live drilling environment and is guaranteed to not cause a spark. And so it's a, there's a very a, a specific certification body um, that actually gives us this designation. And once we launched that product, it was, it, it was just a hockey stick of demand for the, the types of services that we were providing. And so that was a big catalyst to, in the growth. And then of course, um, the world now, as I talked about previously, um, with everybody having so many devices connected on their network at home and everywhere you go, um, the, certainly the demand is now exploded for everything on the internet, um, controlling uh, everything from wherever you are at a moment's notice on an app. And that's kind of where the world has, go has gone and I don't see it ever coming back. Well, I have to agree with you there. Um... You mentioned that, you know, Global Star services are not broadband services. Now, we're soon going to have two operational uh, LEO constellations, a third one being launched, uh, bringing terabytes of broadband capacity. So as you think about the future of the company, what is its future for this thin root specialized data set of services that you're building and will continue to build out in the next few years? So um, I think we're very lucky that, you know, in some ways, uh, our satellite constellation cannot deliver the broadband services the way it's designed today. Obviously with our, our terrestrial band 53 um, component, we can, but that's on a terrestrial network, not on a satellite network. So the satellites cannot deliver uh, broadband services. I, I'm very glad about that because I don't wanna be in that competitive marketplace with the likes of Kuiper, Amazon um, and, and SpaceX Starlink. Um, that's not a business I would wanna be uh, in uh, and, and compete with those big, big major players. And so we are focused on exactly what I described is low bit data rate services. There's plenty of demand. The market research we have done is something like our addressable market will grow by 2028 to over 8 billion devices. Um, and today we have 700 and, uh, sorry, 460,000, 750,000 total, including spot, 760,000 devices. Um, and 450,000 is in the IoT space for us. So there's a lot of room for growth. We believe we could capture a significant part of the market share, um, but there is plenty for everyone who's going after this market. Well, that's good news for everybody. Uh, having plenty is better than having, having less. I think I learned that in business somewhere along the way. <laughs> Dave, that has to be it for now. Uh, really appreciate the time you spent with us. I want to once again congratulate you on a remarkable career, and I hope you keep on having fun because obviously you are. I am having fun. We um, it's it's a great team at Global Star. Um, we we just completed a, a major refinancing of the company. Uh, we're very excited about that, um, and the, the, it's a, just a lot, it is a lot of fun because of the people that we have at Global Star, and the, and it's fun to go to work, and it's fun to work with those folks. So I really do enjoy it. Well, excellent. I look forward to our next chance to chat. Thank you, Robert.
Like any tech industry, the space and satellite business is driven by the ambition, by the leadership skills and the knowledge of its people. And in our Making Leaders series, we take time away from business planning and technology roadmaps to focus on the people making a difference. We thank our members and content sponsors, Access Intelligence, Airbus OneWeb Satellites, EchoStar, Hughes Network Systems, k l Gates, Mansat, Network Innovations Group, Northrop Grumman, SES Global, and ST Engineering iDirect for making this program possible. You can follow us on Twitter at SSPI. On Facebook or LinkedIn, just search for Space and Satellite Professionals. If you're not a member, first of all, that's a problem. But I do encourage you to become one by going to sspi.org slash join, that's J-O-I-N. And finally, are you space business qualified? Well, you are if you've registered for SBQ, which is a series of self-paced online training courses in the fundamentals of the space business, from launch and spacecraft to communications and markets. They're produced by SSBI in partnership with GVF and the online training company SatProf. And you can learn more about SBQ at spacebq.org. That's spacebakerquebec.org. For SSBI and Making Leaders, this is Robert Bell. <laughs>